Hello everyone. In this lecture, I am going to discuss about the menstrual cycle or the female reproductive cycle. So, as you can see on this board that uh, I have drawn with a simplified figure, isn't so? So, please watch this video till the end because I will show you how to draw this figure very easily. Yes, and what all interconnecting concepts are there? That uh, how this physiological process took place? and what all regulatory mechanism are there and what all changes took place in the ovary and the uterus at the same time. So what is menstrual cycle? It is a physiological process that take place in a woman's body uh, due to the control of HPO axis that is hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis that we'll discuss later. So because of this control there are the mechanism which are going to take place in the ovary and the uterus at the same moment and there are many fluctuations in the hormones and that all may lead into the uh, shedding of the endometrial lining the innermost lining of the uterus so we can say that the menstrual cycle is just the physiological process that causes the uterine bleeding it is just only the uterine bleeding because the blood is not coming uh, through the other source that is from the cervix or the vagina it just from the uterine cavity and why it is happening because there are the fluctuation and that may lead into the this fluid loss yes so uh, this cycle usually lasts for about 28 days but there are many variation if the cycle is less than 21 days or if it is goes more than or beyond 35 days then we consider it pathological but here we are just discussing about the normal findings yes so uh, the total amount of blood loss which took place in this each menstrual cycle is about 20 to 80 ml uh, and on an average we are considering about 35 ml yes it is again not fixed because it is not fixed amount that uh, in each cycle there is uh, that much amount of blood is only losing yes so there may be a variation and maximally it goes up to the 80 ml and the duration of the menstrual blood loss that is the menstruation phase in this cycle is last for about one to five days. it means uh, we are taking it uh, about five days on an average but again it may vary in some women uh, only it takes three days to complete or in some it takes seven days to complete so uh, here in this lecture we just considered about the five days of duration of this menstruation phase where the bleeding takes place yes and in this bleeding uh, what all substances what is the actually composition of this menstrual fluid the maximum is the blood and along with that there are some cervical mucus the vaginal mucus as well as the prostaglandins enzymes electrolytes some bacteria these all composite of menstrual fluid yes now here we will discuss what is the HPO axis and how it is controlling the changes which took place in the ovary and the uterus and at what all fluctuation you can see in the hormonal level yes so what is HPO axis H stands for hypothalamus P is pituitary and O is ovary so for the smooth running of this reproductive cycle this h2 axis should be intact and it should be coordinated well and if there is any deviation in the normal coordination then the menstrual cycle will not be running in a proper pace yes so first we'll discuss what is the controlling system that is what is the h2 axis so in the h2 axis here i'm drawing the hypothalamus yes So this is the hypothalamus and it is connected with the connecting stalk with the pituitary gland and in the pituitary again we know that there are the two lobes but here uh, we just want only anterior pituitary because the hormone which releases from this anterior pituitary that only control the activities of ovary and the uterus. So here it is the anterior pituitary. Now, what happened in the hypothalamus, that is the muscles of muscle gland that control many activities in our body. But here we just only discuss about the reproductive cycle, how it is controlling. So in the hypothalamus, there are some nucleuses. 
there are some nucleuses the neurosecretory cell and these neurosecretory cells are usually the collection of neuronal cell bodies okay so here these are called as arcuate nucleus so these are the collection of neuronal cell bodies what these causes these releases some special substances these releases some special substances and these substances are releases via the hypophyseal portal system these substances are releases via the hypophyseal portal system that is the microcirculation the blood vessel okay so through the blood vessels they are they are releasing some substances or what they are called these substances are called gnrh gonadotrophin releasing hormone gonadotrophin it means the substance which stimulate the activities of gonad gonad means in uh, female gonad is the ovary okay so these substances are released through this hypophyseal portal system and it activates the anterior pituitary that is adenohypophysis anterior pituitary and once this become activated the cells within this become activated what they does they releases again two type of gonadotrophs what they are called these are follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone and by this effect these two triggers the ovary okay because there are some receptors regarding this gonadotroph and these then bind to these receptors in the ovary and then the ovary becomes stimulated and releases the two important steroid hormone that is called the estrogen and progesterone yes so this is called the hpo axis now before we go with the ovarian and uterine changes let me draw here the two important organ that shows all these changes that is the uterus first i am drawing here the uterus so in the uterus you know the uppermost part is the fundus yes and here is the body corpus or the cavity yes and below to that is the vagina and from this fundus region there are the paired ov ducts that are called the fallopian tube yes both side i'm just drawing on the single side only and the main female gonad that is called the ovary now before we go with this all changes uh, let me clear few important point that uh, in the female gonad that is in a ovary there are specialized cell and these specialized cell uh, usually in each monthly cycle goes into the developmental process and then finally they become mature and releases one egg cell or the ova okay that is the whole process so what the cells called as these are the germ cell okay these are the germ cells these all derive from the yolk sac from where these are arising from the yolk sac when during the embryonic life itself so when the fetus in the uh, in the intrauterine life it means the when the fetus in the womb at that time only they develops these germ cells so in the yolk sac these germ cells are derived and from there they migrate to the gonadal ridge and these gonadal ridge later forms the ovary so in the embryonic life when these germ cells migrate in the gonadal ridge after reaching there they multiply they differentiate and form oogonia what they called as oogonias okay and continuously these oogonias multiply mitotically and they differentiate and at 20 week of gestation they become 7 million in number yes they reaches up till 7 million in number and from there what happened some of the oogonias now enter into the meiotic first division okay some of the oogonias enter into the meiotic first division and after entering this they form the two daughter cell and there 
these are called as primary oocyte yes so after entering inside the meiotic first division they called as primary oocyte but here what happened this division is not completed here they remain arrested in the prophase first in the diplotene stage yes please remember so when they enter into the meiotic first division they are called as uh, primordial follicle so what is prime primordial follicle in which there is a primary oocyte here it is the primary oocyte and that enclosed by a flat single granulosa pre granulosa layer that is called the primordial follicle yes so in the 20 week of gestation there are many primordial follicle and how much they are they are in 7 million in number yes from here also these all uh, goes into the differentiation but what happened they do not complete their division so what happened when the birth of the baby took place these all 7 million primary oocyte or you can say the primordial follicles are not reaching uh, in the ovary whereas in many of them become degenerated they become atrophic uh, by the programmed cell death by the process of apoptosis okay so only at birth 2 million primary oocytes are only left behind yes now from birth till the puberty they went again uh, in the degenerative process because from out of 2 million they all are not reach in the pubertal stage uh, again there are the degeneration of many of the follicle and only 4 lakhs reach up till the puberty and the another important fact is that out of 4 lakh only 400 reproductive Uh, ovaries are there that reproduce in women's entire life yes that is the very important thing but what i am telling you is that these all primary oocyte do not complete their meiotic first division until they reach puberty they remain arrested from what time they are remaining arrested during intrauterine life itself they are arrested until the puberty reaches they are in same phase yes there is no change takes place yes but as the puberty reaches and once the women enter into the menarche once she started with her first menstrual cycle then there are the developmental changes that took place in the ovary and that may progress and then only it completes the meiotic first division that i told you when it is going to be complete now we'll start what happened after the puberty once the women start with her menarche yes so there are many there are many 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 primordial follicles okay many primordial follicles which are present in the ovaries that is in each ovary and what are primary primordial follicle that is the primary oocyte enclosed by a single flat cell granulosa cell that is called the primordial here i am drawing only one but there are many more okay so once the woman reaches the puberty there are many primordial follicle which are selected and recruited for each cycle okay that is very important not a single primordial follicle is selected for being mature there are many group of primordial follicle the cohort of follicle that are being selected or recruited for particular cycle and how long before they are uh, selected that is it is very important the follicle which is released in this particular cycle it is being recruited 3 month before that is very important so suppose this follicle is now uh, going into a maturational phase and here it develops into the mature follicle and then it will release that actually underwent the differentiation 3 month before so this whole process the selection and the recruitment of follicle and then from the maturation phase this whole till it releases its secondary oocyte this whole process takes 85 days it takes 85 days to complete yes is it clear so suppose here are many primordial follicle which are situated in this ovary and these all are recruited or selected uh, for the developmental process so initially they are not required any uh, gonadotrophin control for their development initially they develop by their own by some local uh, hormones so these some local hormones which are released from these cells only they generally help them to enlarge more and finally these primordial follicle 
turn to change into the primary follicle. So what is primary follicle? These all primordial follicles are changing into the primary follicle. And what is primary follicle? That is the primary oocyte when enclosed by a single or multiple layer of granulosa cell around this primordial follicle. Yes. So when the primary oocyte enclosed by multiple layer of cuboidal granulosa cell then it is called as primary follicle and at this stage these granulosa cell develops few FSH receptor okay they, they develop receptors for FSH follicle stimulating hormone yes now from here will coordinate all the activities which took place in the ovary and the uterus and what hormones are responsible for that yes so let me draw a figure first here uh, about the graphical presentation of the hormone so let me here draw the number of days first so as you know that in a menstrual cycle in a regular menstrual cycle there is a day of uh, 28 day of cycle so here I am mentioning the day 1 or the 0 day 1 is the first day of menstrual bleeding yes so from day 1 to day 5 is the menstruation phase so what it is the menstruation phase where the bleeding appears yes from day 5 to day 14 is the pre ovulatory phase pre ovulatory because this appeared before the ovulation and day 14 is considered to be the ovulation ovulation phase yes and from 14 to day 28 is the post ovulatory is the post ovulatory phase now in the ovary and the uterus these all are termed with the different terms like in the ovary if we talk about the in ovary from 0 to 14 day is considered to be follicular phase yes follicular phase and at the same time in the uterus in the uterus when the follicular phase is going on in the uterus there is a proliferation phase proliferation phase proliferative phase and in the post ovulatory again in the ovary in the ovary there is a luteal phase and in the uterus there is a secretory phase so these are the phases in the reproductive or menstrual cycle so let's begin with this uh, what all changes took place in the ovary so here i have told you that there are many primordial follicle which are being selected and recruited 85 day before ovulation uh, now they with the local chemicals they just grow and they turn to change into the primary follicle okay now from primary follicle there are some receptors which develop in these granulosa cell regarding the FSH now they require FSH for their further development yes so from here primary follicle to secondary follicle they require FSH so from here the signal sent to the gonadotrophs that is from the hypothalamus these all HPO axes work together and they releases FSH what they does release they release FSH and the uh, influence of this FSH under the influence of FSH finally this primary follicle change into the secondary follicle they change into the secondary follicle so what is secondary follicle again there is a primary oocyte here and this primary oocyte is enclosed by a single layer of glycoprotein rich secretion that is called zona pellucida and from here uh, zona pellucida again there are multiple layer of granulosa cell that surround this whole follicle and after this granulosa cell again there are some layer of connective tissues and the vascular layer that is called the theca layer okay so under the influence of FSH what is happening this primary follicle is changed into the secondary follicle but the important thing is that 
it is not completing its meiotic first division here also okay so it is being arrested in the meiotic first division till this stage also okay now at this moment what is happening we'll discuss maturation phase later what is happening in this uh, follicular phase because here what is happening the ssh let me draw the ssh by red so in this phase what is happening with the influence of ssh so here you can say that the ssh is rising follicular stimulating hormone is rising because with this influence only it is going to be developed okay and meanwhile what ssh is does this ssh help in developing the receptor on these granulosa cell as well as on the theca cell and what all receptors these all building the ssh receptors are built on granulosa cell and the nh receptor built upon the theca cell under the influence of ssh yes that is very important step yes so once these receptors are built upon this uh, cells what important step is going to take place here is that let me draw uh, suppose here it is the granulosa cell and this is the theca cell yes so what all activities are going to take place in this there are the receptor of ssh there are the receptor of ssh on granulosa cell and there are receptor of luteinizing hormone on theca cell yes so theca cell is more vascular so because of this vascularity it directly receive ldl cholesterol it receive ldl cholesterol low density low density lipoprotein cholesterol from the blood stream and from this cholesterol this lh hormone change this cholesterol into androstenedione androstenedione this is the weak steroid androgen so under the influence of luteinizing hormone this receive the cholesterol from the blood and this cholesterol change into the weak androgen and this androgen that is androstenedione then diffuse in the granulosa cell here it is the weak androgen that is androstenedione and this granulosa cell under the influence of fsh change this androgen into the estradiol this change into the estradiol that is under the effect of aromatase enzyme okay so with the presence of aromatase this androgen is changed into the estradiol that is the form of estrogen this is the one of the steroid hormone which we required here for the development of follicle and for the further activities yes so in this phase you can see here now in the follicular phase which hormone is activating here fsh and when the fsh is rising along with that what is happening the estrogen is also built up this estrogen is also going to be rise slowly okay now again there are the receptors for the lh so you can say that the lh is also rising very slowly yes so this is the lh luteinizing hormone okay but very important thing happens here what is once the ssh and lh receptors are built upon the cell and these are releasing more estrogen by converting this cholesterol into estradiol this estrogen creates a negative feedback system on this hypothalamus and that decreases the release of fsh because here it sends some signal that i am developing then there is no more need of further follicle to grow okay so it is being selected it is being selected so uh, around day 7 or 8 one follicle is being selected for further development so it sends signal to stop uh, developing further follicles okay so once the support from this fsh is declined once the support from this fsh is declined the follicle which are growing here the prime model follicle that is the group of follicle because here there is no single follicle which is growing yes so the group of follicle which all are growing here in this phase 
what happened with this effect of this negative feedback system this all only one is being recruited and selected remaining all become atretic or they become degenerate at this space so there are many follicles in each menstrual cycle uh, which are being degenerated and only one is being selected because in a each menstrual cycle there is only one ova which is going to be released yes this is very important and again with this estrogen effect what happened in this uterine um, cavity that is there is a proliferation phase so at the time of follicular phase when the follicles are growing with the effect of fsh in the uterus what is happening there are again estrogen receptor which are present in this uterine cavity and that help in the formation of or the regeneration of new layer okay so with the effect of estrogen what is happening there is the regeneration of new layer there is regeneration or reepithelialization of new layer because in the endometrium there are two lining the inner lining is called stratum basalis suppose this one is the stratum basalis and the this innermost one that lying toward the cavity is the stratum functionalis so the shedding of the endometrium if we talk about this shedding of endometrium the lining which shed here is the stratum functionalis the stratum basalis never shed off this basalis give rise to new functional layer but it never shed off okay so in the follicular phase with the effect of estrogen because in the endometrium now which hormone is predominantly work estrogen so with the effect of estrogen new functional layer is building okay so what is happening in this functional layer there are some spiral arteries uh, which supply this functional layer they build up here yes there are some endometrial glands which are going to build here but these are of tubular shape tube like structure these all endometrial gland they all start grow in the proliferation phase of uterus okay so in this mid follicular phase the one follicle is being selected and then the rest become atretic yes now what happened from here once the support from this fsh is declined yes here i am declining the fsh support uh, the fsh is now is going to be decrease yes here the fsh is going to be decreased and along with that the lh is also declining but the estrogen level is rising because these follicular cells continuously producing the estrogen yes okay now at this stage the this follicle already developed the number of receptors for fsh and lh so here this does not require any fsh support for further its Uh, maturation yes so it mature by its own and finally this tertiary uh, the secondary follicle change into the mature follicle okay the secondary follicle this all went into the early secondary and late secondary follicle but here i'm not discussing in detail that i already discussed in detail about uh, the oogenesis video so you can watch that video so from here the secondary follicle is moving toward the maturation phase and this a uh, change into the mature graphene follicle or uh, the tertiary follicle okay or the vesicular follicle uh, which is of about the 20 mm of size so before uh, it ovulate it reaches up to the 20 mm size or you can say 2.5 cm even though okay so before that what happens uh, it means we are discussing about the late follicular phase or the late proliferative phase but before the ovulation we are not talking about the ovulation we are talking about just before ovulation what all events are going to take place so let me draw here the uh, structure of the mature graphene follicle that uh, in mature graphene follicle uh, in the mature there is uh, oocyte that i discussed what is this oocyte and there are the covering of glycoprotein layer of oocyte that is called zona pellucida and there are multiple layer of uh, granulosa cell the granulosa cell which cover this oocyte is called cumulus oophorus and this cumulus oophorus again 
help this oocyte to connect with the follicular wall of this graphene follicle. So here it is the cumulus oophorus that surround the oocyte and this uh, give attachment to this follicular wall and surrounding to that are the uh, theca connective tissue layer that is theca interna as well as the theca externa okay and in between also there are some follicular fluid that is called the antral cavity or antrum uh, that makes by these granules a cell only so what happened again with this uh, granulosa cell because the granulosa cell is producing estrogen so with this high amount of estrogen so when the follicle is producing massive amount of estrogen in the bloodstream what happened again it creates positive feedback on the hypothalamus so before that we'll figure out few values here so when the estrogen is rising more how much it is rising there should be an increase of uh, 200 picogram in each ml and it should persist for about 48 hour in bloodstream yes talking here is the estrogen so if the estrogen is rising continuously uh, that the estrogen is producing more in blood and it remain in blood for about 24 to 36 hour continuously that continuous level of estrogen help in giving the positive feedback on the hypothalamus so by this positive feedback the hypothalamus is being triggered by this estrogen and then this releases the another stimulus by the fsh and lh release yes so just before the ovulation by this peak of estrogen what is happening there is a lh surge it means the level of luteinizing hormone is rising yes and this LH surge should be continued should be continued for at least 34 to 36 hours so when the LH surge appears means when the LH level is rising more continuously this LH surge help in LH peak that the LH remain at a peak level okay and that could be of about 10 to 12 hours before ovulation okay so what is happening here before ovulation here it is the ovulation day okay so before ovulation what is happening there is a this red one is fsh there is a sudden again rise in fsh level okay there is rise in fsh level yes before ovulation and the estrogen is rising more the estrogen is rising more okay but this estrogen peak help in releasing more LH that is about 10 times higher there is a LH surge as less there is a LH peak that sustained for about 10 to 12 hours before ovulation yes that is a very important thing here okay so what all things are happening here is that very important before ovulation with this estrogen peak when the hypothalamus is being triggered by this rise in level of estrogen the more fsh and more lh will be releasing and that all may lead into the many events what all events are going to take place firstly in the uterine cavity what is happening with this estrogen peak the cervical mucus become thin before ovulation or around the ovulation what happens the cervix become releasing thin mucus because this is the moment when the fertilization took place so it allow the sperm it allows the sperm to penetrate the uterine cavity and reach up to the fallopian tube if it is thick then the sperm will not be able to enter in the uterine cavity and reach up to the destination that is the ampullary part of the fallopian tube yes so with this effect it become thin the another thing with this high estrogen there is LH surge and this LH surge lead into the LH peak and this LH peak along with that these granulosa cell also releases one more hormone that is uh, inhibin inhibin B and because of inhibin B again what happened this FSH goes down this FSH goes down because it 
providing signal to the hypothalamus that there is more no more need of further follicle to grow okay yes there is a sudden rise in fsh before the ovulation but there is no more need of follicle for being grown okay so again with the release of inhibin b the fsh tend to decline okay now the many more events are going to take place before ovulation so what all are there with this lh peak this lh also releases in a limited amount of progesterone and prostaglandin also releasing progesterone and prostaglandin from these okay and with this lh surge what happened this oocyte which lying in this follicle that complete it meiotic first division okay if you remember the arrested meiotic first division which was arrested in the fetal life now in this mid of the cycle it completes by this lh surge okay so with this lh surge this meiotic first division is now going to be complete and here after division it forms again two daughter cell one is secondary oocyte and the another one is the first polar body so in this mature graphene follicle the oocyte now is going to be called as secondary oocyte and again this oocyte went into the another meiotic second division once secondary oocyte forms it goes into the another division that is the meiosis second division but again it remain in metaphase second phase okay so yes the first meiotic division completes here it forms two daughter cell and another division took place but here again it being arrested okay now with this all effect the granulosa cells are releasing estrogen they are releasing progesterone in limited amount they are releasing prostaglandin okay some proteolytic enzymes are also releasing around this day 14 and what happened with this proteolytic enzyme the cumulus oophorus is being separated from this follicular wall and by the effect of all this hormone uh, there is a conical stigma is developed here projection is developed here the stigma uh, forms because of uh, the thinning of this follicular wall as well as the rupturing of this ovarian wall okay and this all contribute in releasing the secondary oocyte or the cumulus oophorus outside this ovary okay so on the day of 14th by this all cumulative effect the secondary oocyte is now released with the glycoprotein layer of zona pellucida and there are some granulosa cells which surround this secondary oocyte is now being called as corona radiata so by this manner on the day of 14 bit of the menstrual cycle the secondary oocyte is now released and in some time a few women may have uh, pain around this time because uh, with this rupturing of follicle and the ovarian wall there is some fluid which leaks out in the peritoneal cavity or there may be some bleed so this all fluid and bleeding causes irritation in the peritoneal cavity that may cause pain or irritation in a woman and this is called as middle smurge syndrome okay so that is happening around day 14 so here we reach in the mid of the cycle that is day 14 what is happening there is a lh peak the estrogen is more rising before ovulation the fsh is drop down because here there is no further follicle follicles are required but yes there is a uh, few amount of progesterone here the progesterone is not uh, rising but just before the ovulation there is few amount of progesterone which is rising here yes so these are the hormonal fluctuation which took place during pre ovulatory or you can say in the follicular phase of ovary or in the proliferative phase of the uterus now what happened once the secondary oocyte is released there are uh, the finger like projection uh, in the infundibular portion of the fallopian tube that sweep around the ovary or ovarian surface so that they can pick the secondary oocyte and as this is picked up by this finger like projection this is reach up to the ampullary part of the fallopian tube because it is the most widest and the largest portion where actually fertilization took place 
so here it is the uh, secondary oocyte which reaches up to this region and just waiting for the sperm to come and fertilize so the lifespan of the secondary oocyte is uh, here is about 12 to 24 hour and if meanwhile that time of sperm comes then only fertilization takes place and if it is not come then uh, this become degenerated and phagocytosed by the cells there may be neutrophils or uh, macrophages and all uh, it is not like that this goes here and it is excreted out through this uh, menstrual bleeding yes now what happens once it reaches here what happened with this remaining structure this follicular structure which remain behind uh, in this ovary that become convoluted what happened this all granulosa cell and the theca cells fold inside and they form convoluted structure here they hypertrophied here okay and they collect many fat uh, globules okay they collect fat and lipid globules uh, because of that they are called as yellow body now this remaining structure is here called as corpus luteum okay so once the structure form in the ovary what phase started in the ovary that is the luteal phase because here this corpus luteum receives many uh, LH receptors on granulosa cell as well as the theca cell okay and uh, once it is formed the granulosa cell here is also more vascularized okay initially the vascularization is only took place around the theca cell but now as it is being convoluted more vessels are growing in so granulosa cell is also vascular vascularizing here also okay so the lifespan of this corpus luteum is about two weeks that is for 12 to 14 days and if meanwhile the sperm cell is reaches there and it fertile the secondary oocyte then uh, this lifespan will exceed okay how it will exceeding that will discuss later so in the luteal phase of the ovary the corpus luteum is forming here uh, by the granulosa and the theca cell which remain uh, behind once the secondary oocyte is released so the corpus luteum here releases very important four hormones here what all four are there one is the uh, primarily the hormone which is releasing from here is the progesterone the another is estrogen inhibin and relaxin okay so how this uh, cells are releasing this hormone the formation of estrogen the formation of estrogen hormone that is steroid hormone is in the same manner that they receive um, the cholesterol from the bloodstream and they aromatize this weak androgen and this then convert into the estradiol but uh, these granulosa cell the granulosa cell which left behind in this corpus luteum they become luteinized because they also develop LH receptor on these cell okay they, they develop LH receptor also and they become more vascularized in this structure so they receive directly LDL cholesterol from the bloodstream and this then convert into the progesterone in the granulosa cell itself okay so this is how this is releasing estrogen as well as the progesterone so what all things happen in the uterine cavity during the secretory phase post ovulatory phase uh, in the uterus so in a secretory phase initially this endometrial lining is completely depends on the estrogen in the pre-ovulatory phase now it is completely depends on the progesterone okay so by the effect of progesterone now this lining the stratum function because what happened during pre-ovulatory phase the thickness of this lining is of about 3 to 4 mm yes but once during proliferative phase but once the secretory phase appears and the progesterone work upon this endometrial lining this become more thick and it reaches up to the 6 to 8 mm thickness yes and what all changes appear in this functional layer the spiral arterioles become more convoluted they become more spiraled yes spiral arterioles initially they are straight but now they become more coiled more spiraled okay more dense highly vascular layer it became okay and the glands which are initially tubular now these also become highly foldable they become convoluted 
okay they become more convoluted so there are more folds in this glands by the effect of progesterone yes and along with that the glands uh, contain subnuclear vacuoles in each, there, there is the development of subnuclear vacuoles and they collect the glycogen in these vacuoles so in a secretory phase these uh, this glycogen rich secretion or glycoprotein or the mucopolysaccharide which contain in these subnuclear vacuoles this usually enter in the lumen and they directly release in the surface of this uh, lining okay so this uh, uterine milk this is also called the uterine milk now visible in this uterine cavity and it is more in a secretory phase so why it is in secretory phase because this lining is preparing for the pregnancy they are waiting for the fertilized ova for the blastocyst for the implantation and it give nourishment for the initial structure yes so that's why it is in a secretory phase because this whole preparation is in the anticipation of pregnancy itself isn't so so in the secretory phase now the endometrium is in completely on progesterone dependent okay so this progesterone makes this this lining more thick more vascular more glandular more uh, glycogen rich secretory phase yes so let's see here what all hormones are working here yes so uh, i have told you that the fsh is now declining and yes it is still declining because there is no further requirement of uh, any follicle to be uh, mature yes so along with that the lh the luteinizing hormone is also dropped down because there is no more, no more follicle is there but there is slight rise in because there is a luteinization of corpus luteum okay so uh, it is not in a peak level but it is slightly releasing some hormone okay but if we talk about uh, the estrogen then initially after the ovulation it declines it declines because secondary oocyte is already formed and it releases but once the corpus luteum is working in mid of the cycle of the secretory phase it again rise yes it again rise in the mid of the secretory phase but if we talk about the progesterone that is very important uh, hormone initially it is not rising and just before ovulation there is sudden slight rise in uh, progesterone level but once corpus luteum forms what happen this progesterone level tend to rise more and more and in mid of the luteal phase it is releasing more uh, around day 21 because from uh, 21 day it means that is day around 7 to 8 it is releasing more progesterone because at that time it is more in secretory phase and it anticipate that there may be a blastocyst that could be implanted okay so in mid of this luteal phase there is high amount of progesterone okay and along with that this progesterone also causes a thick plug in this cervical mucus so there is a thick mucoid plug in the cervix that prevent the ascending infection from the vagina or the cervix in the uterine cavity uh, this is also by the effect of progesterone so what event importantly here take place if the secondary oocyte become fertile with the sperm firstly it complete its meiotic second division yes so already i have told you that uh, once secondary oocyte forms and uh, it releases before that it just enter into the meiotic second division but it remain arrested when it is going to be complete only when the sperm reaches here and it become fertile then only it completes it meiotic second division okay so meiotic second division is going to be complete when the fertilization takes place that is very important but if it is not fertile then the meiotic second division never took place yes but here i am talking that this secondary oocyte is now fertilized so what happened the all event which took place here i already detailedly described in the previous videos so you can watch these all video 
I'm just going through with a very fast review that after fertilization, when it reaches here, there is a formation of blastocyst. Okay, so once the blastocyst is formed here, the outer lining of the blastocyst is called the trophoblast. Yes, and this trophoblast again differentiate into two, and the outer lining is called the syncytial trophoblast. And once the blastocyst implant itself in this endometrial cavity uh, in the endometrium. Uh, this syncytial trophoblast releases some other chemicals that is called HCG, human coronic gonadotrophin. So once the HCG is released around day 21 to 25 day, what happened that is in the uh, mid of this luteal cycle, this release of HCG again bind to the same LH receptor, again bind to the same LH receptor. Uh, which was present in the granulosa cell or the theca cell okay and this rescue this corpus luteum this rescue this corpus luteum to being degenerate because uh, here the lifespan of this is of about only two weeks and if it is not fertilized what happened this become degenerated but once it become fertile and it releases hcg the hcg bind to this lh receptor here and this rescue this corpus luteum and it allows to release more estrogen and progesterone till six week of pregnancy yes so it rescue this blastocyst rescue corpus luteum for about six week during pregnancy okay and continuously continuously it releasing estrogen and progesterone and maintain the pregnancy because progesterone is the uh, hormone responsible for maintenance yes so it continuously releasing but what happened afterwards now this blastocyst uh, change its function and uh, that is a luteal placental shift and the whole action the whole action during pregnancy is now being transferred into the placenta so after it being mature in the placental structure this placenta only releases estrogen and progesterone the function of corpus luteum is thereby Gone. okay so when it is going to be happen when the pregnancy is going to be appear okay so if uh, the fertilization do not take place then what happens okay that is the main topic of interest in this lecture once the fertilization do not take place after two week of uh, post ovulatory period the action of corpus luteum become decline yes so all the uh, hormones which are rise in this mid luteal phase they are going to be declined because the signals are not coming from this blastocyst okay because they are uh, giving the signals in the mid luteal phase so once the signals are not receiving till this corpus luteum what happened the progesterone is going to be declined yes the estrogen is also going to be declined yes but what happened once this create a feedback to the gonad uh, to the hypothalamus what happened slowly slowly what happened just before the menstruation just before the menstruation there is slowly the rise in the FSH level okay sorry here it is the FSH slowly there is a rise in FSH sudden rise in FSH because now it gives signal to the hypothalamus that this follicle is being destroyed now there is the need for the another follicle to be grown okay so once these all hormones become declined and there is sudden rise in ssh what next phase comes after this corpus uh, sorry luteal phase that is the menstruation phase okay so there is uh, the bleeding which appears in the uterine cavity because of the shedding of this endometrial lining that is the stratum functionalis so how it is being uh, shed off there is an intense spiraling of this spiral arteriols okay so uh, the estrogen and progesterone is going to be declined and the local prostaglandins tend to be rise so prostaglandin are also rising from this endometrial as well as the myometrial lining and they causes vasoconstriction as well as myometrial contraction yes and some local proteolytic enzymes as well as inflammatory mediators are also releasing like neutrophils macrophages these all causes inflammatory pro-inflammatory response 
and um, because of this intense vasospasm the the uh, they are not supplying enough nutrient to the cells and that may lead into the ischemia and the cell become necrosed and they become dead so they become shed off okay so this is how the effect of prostaglandin as well as the local inflammatory mediators protolytic enzymes combinedly work upon this and causes the shedding of endometrial lining and the menstrual bleeding appears in this menstruation phase yes so in this menstruation phase there is a bleeding phase but what happen how this bleeding stops as there is sudden rise in fsh what happen there is slight rise in fsh because Uh, the signals are already being sent to the hypothalamus that there is the requirement for the further follicle okay so as the fsh is slightly rising here i'm drawing as the fsh is rising slowly the follicles are converting into the another developing stage and this releases some estrogen yes so there is slight release of estrogen here and this estrogen release help in building the new epithelium okay so there is a reepithelialization okay what all things stop the bleeding there is the reepithelialization of endometrial lining it does not like that that once the endometrial completely shed off then only the new layer grown okay that uh, shedding of the endometrial lining as well as the reepithelialization of the new layer is appear simultaneously yes this is a very important thing so there is the reepithelialization of new layer uh, by the effect of this estrogen okay and the another thing is uh, there are the prolonged vasoconstriction that stop bleeding prolonged vasoconstriction and the myometrial contraction is there and the thirdly there is the a uh, physiological clotting mechanism that the platelet aggregation is there that all combinedly work upon that and that stop the bleeding okay and the further cycle starts so here in this lecture we have seen the menstrual cycle or the reproductive cycle and in this cycle which is completely under the control of hpo axis that regulate this cycle in the ovary and the uterus yes and there are the four phases of this cycle what are four are there the first that is from the day 1 to 5 is the menstruation phase from 5 to 14 is the pre ovulatory phase and on the day of 14 is the ovulation from 14 to 28 is the post ovulatory phase and along with that we have already uh, talked about the various phases which took place in the ovary and the uterus thank you